number five of the no-brainer investor called mutual fund picking. To start with, we're going to do some definitions. These are real important, basic definitions to make sure you understand them so we can clarify some of these concepts regarding mutual funds. The first one is market sector. And market sector just refers to picking a specific part of the stock markets and focusing on that part. For instance, you might just focus on energy or you might have just high tech stocks. You might have the total US stock market. You might have the, um, the European market or Asian market, etc. Now for each of these markets, you have what's called a market index. And that's an average of the stocks within that sector. And it gives you a good idea then of how well that particular sector is doing because they won't all be doing the same. Sometimes one sector will go up and do well. Other times, at the same time, another sector may go down. So one of the most well-known indices is the S&P 500 index which is an average that indicates how well the total U.S. market is doing. Now that's not quite true because the S&P 500 tends to focus a little bit more on larger companies and there are other indices which include a larger number and particularly smaller uh, companies. But it's a good one to just sort of be aware of and sort of a good indices to tell how well the total market's doing. Mutual funds are pools of stocks and bonds that specialize in a particular market sector. And in order to know how well a mutual fund's doing, we need some kind of a benchmark. And a benchmark is when we just compare that fund to the index for the particular sector that it's specializing in. Managed funds are mutual funds that have a manager. Now remember, a, well, a mutual fund will generally pick a specific sector, and then if it has a manager, the manager tries to buy and sell and hold stocks within that sector and tries to beat their benchmark or do better than their particular chosen sector. However, some funds, in particular index funds, passive funds, or exchange traded funds do not try to beat their, their index or their sector. They try to just match their specific index. That is, they try to be just average, which doesn't sound that great, but it turns out it's really the way to go, as we'll see soon. Expense ratio is the basic cost to you for owning a mutual fund. There's always going to be a cost. It goes to the company that, who runs the fund, and it's listed as a percentage of your total investment paid to the company per year. So that's your expense ratio. Now, in addition to that, many times there can be other costs. So the total cost is your expense ratio plus any additional costs. And these can be management fees, performance fees, sales charges, transaction fees, purchase fees, redemption fees, and, and, and et cetera. So it's very important to know what the total cost of owning your fund is. And sometimes it might be a little tricky to find these out. So in some instances, you will pay more than just an expense ratio. You'll pay additional fees and costs. Be careful about that and know what they are. Okay, here's an example why it's important to understand these basic concepts. A friend of mine not too long ago came to me who does not manage his own retirement account, but has an advisor running it for him. And he's quite happy <clears throat> and satisfied with this advisor. And he mentioned to me that in the last three years, his retirement fund has gone up by 30%. And that really sounds pretty good. If, you, if he started with $100,000, for instance, he would now have $130,000 over three years. Now, it turns out this is not a 10% annualized return, but it's only a 9.14 annualized return because this gets compounded annually. However, at that same time, it turns out 
over these last three years, the S&P 500 index fund had about a 15% return, annualized return, because we've been in a bull market and the S&P is pretty much an indicator of how well the total market is doing. And if he'd started with $100,000 and had been in this fund here, he would have had $152,000. So his cost to him or amount that he did not make if he had been in the S&P 500 was a total of 22,000. Now I'm not I don't know that he was totally in into stocks. I mean part of this might have been in uh, bonds which is not so bad. But when you make a statement of how well you're doing, you have to compare it to some kind of index. And otherwise, it just may sound good, but not be that great compared to what you should be doing. Okay, so let's look at what the average investor in mutual fund does in this country. And there's a company called Del Bar, and I looked at their website, www.delbar.com, and every year they put out a study of how well the average investors are doing. And when I say average, I mean all U.S. investors that are in, uh, in investing in mutual funds. This is not just stock funds. So it turns out over this last 20 years, from 2004 to 2014, the S&P 500 went up on an average of 9.85 per year. So if you were in an index fund, which was matching this average, you would have had $654,000 and $638. Whereas it turns out the average investor did a lot worse. On average, they only made, had an annualized return of 5.19%. $100,000 would have then returned or made it up to $275,000. So the average individual investor in mutual funds does worse than a simple S&P 500. So why is this? And it's really for two reasons. Average investors often try to time the market. That is when to go in and when to come out of start stocks. And statistically, this has been found to be a bad idea. And they fall below average when they try to time because they end up selling too high, I'm so, sorry, selling too low and buying too high. And the second reason that average in mutual fund investors do worse than the average market is because they own a lot of managed funds and pay a lot of these additional fees. So let's look at the totality of, in, of mutual funds. These two blocks represent the totality of all mutual funds. And it turns out that on average, a third of them do in fact beat their benchmark, but about two thirds of them fall below their benchmark by the amount they have to charge you in fees. So it, it kind of looks like Two possible options are only buy funds that outperform their benchmark, which would be great if you could do that. But the problem is we don't know ahead of time which funds are going to beat their benchmark. And if we pick funds that beat the benchmark the year before, that doesn't mean they will continue to. In fact, generally, they tend to fall back to average. And we spend a lot of time hunting them down and transferring funds. The other possibility is to buy the benchmark or index funds and eliminate the fees. Remember the fees um, generally are very low in index funds because you're not paying a manager to try to beat their benchmark. So this is by far the best option is just buy index funds, exchange traded funds or passive funds, which all have generally have low cost fees. You have to be careful though, sometimes they don't. And then just do average. I know that doesn't sound very exciting to do average, but if you do average, generally you'll do better than other traders. So the summary is, on average, managed mutual funds underperform their benchmark by the amount you have to pay in man extra management fees. 
On average, individual investors in mutual funds have an annual return of about half the market. And the conclusion is choose a diversified portfolio of low cost index or exchange traded funds and just sit tight. That concludes fourth lesson on mutual funds. Remember, you can go to my website, nobrainer.com, and there you can look at other lessons. You can make comments and or you can send an email comment to me. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you in the next lesson. Ciao.